All right, this is spine two. We can talk about trauma and emergencies here. Here are my disclosures and acknowledgments to my former colleagues and uh, faculty who uh, worked on these lectures before. Learning objectives are you should be able to discuss the pathophysiology, clinical presentation, differential diagnosis, diagnostic test, surgical, non-surgical, pharmacological, and non-pharmacological treatment, prognosis, potential complications of the following. Now, we already covered uh, several of these, a few of them um, uh, we did not cover uh, as, as listed here, but what we're going to cover now is spinal fractures, cauda equina syndrome, and spinal cord injury, and infection, actually. Sorry, it's not on that list. All right, so we'll break it down by uh, talking a little bit about cervical fractures and then thoracolumbar uh, fractures, particularly at the thoracolumbar junction, and spinal infection. So cauda equina syndrome, we first need to know what is the cauda equina. So remember that the spinal cord ends at the L1, L2 level, okay? So right about here. Right, and here you have what is called the conus medullaris, right? The tip of the spinal cord. So that's where the actual cord ends. Everything below, so what you have is you have, you know, cord sort of coming to this conus, and then everything below that is just the nerve roots, otherwise known as the cauda equina or horse's tail, right? And uh, as you can see, my horse's tail there. That is all those lumbar sacral nerve roots coming down below the conus, okay? So in the lumbar spine, you have mostly cauda equina. You don't have much spinal cord left, except maybe at L1. So compression of these nerve roots cause paralysis and numbness, but not spasticity, right? It's not an upper motor neuron disease. You're not going to get a positive Babinski. You're going to get uh, weakness, right? and numbness so it's it's lo it's lower motor neuron disease it's often misdiagnosed and confused with other diagnoses but if you're accurate and you are truly diagnosing a patient who has a cauda syndrome call it make a big deal about it it's a true surgical emergency so it's most commonly due to compression of multiple lumbar and sacral nerve roots at the level of the cauda equina uh, the most common cause of compression is the lumbar disc herniation. So, you know, a, a similar phenomenon that happens in the cervical spine or the thoracic spine is going to cause spinal cord compression. That's pretty bad too. It's just that lumbar disc herniations and similar phenomena are fairly common, and um, uh, a bad one uh, can potentially cause uh, not a spinal cord injury uh, compression, but cauda equina compression. So, sorry if I'm beating up this um, uh, topic, but it's just a very simple anatomic distinction that uh, you need to know. So it's most common with a central disc herniation. I would refer you back to my last lecture uh, in which we talked about disc lumbar disc herniations and sort of the different types of disc herniations. And you saw the central one is the one that affects all the descending nerve roots. More frequent in males in the fourth decade, frequently at the L4-5 level. So these could be degenerative, traumatic from disc herniation, could be due to deformity, could be from a fracture, um, could be iatrogenic by way of treatment or a tumor can cause this. And you clinically get a cl uh, classically get a clinical triad of saddle anesthesia, sciatica, and urinary retention. So the key is a large distended bladder or normicturition for more than six hours prior to presentation. So check up PBR, post void residual. The patient has overflow incontinence and re retention. You, you know, should be concerned about this. So the, the you know, symptoms can be acute, subacute, or chronic, depending on what the etiology is. Um, these are the key clinical components. Perineal sensory deficit or saddle anesthesia, like if you're sitting on a horse saddle, like the part that you're you know, the part of your butt that's basically sitting, that part gets numb. Um, so saddle anesthesia, urinary retention, constipation, right? So that's not something you're going to pick up on right away. Uh, this is something that 
long-standing uh, untreated uh, condition is going to lead to. Um, but the urinary retention should become apparent relatively soon. Uh, new onset sensory deficit, new or progressive motor deficit, right? So if your clinical exam is very suspicious and you get an MRI or myelogram with post-myelogram CT clearly showing something causing significant compression with your clinical symptoms and signs, then you may have a Cotaquinas syndrome and uh, this is typically treated with urgent surgery to decompress the nerve roots. Let's deal with whatever the offending lesion is, um, infection, disc herniation, trauma, fracture, uh, and uh, alleviate the pressure on the nerve roots. Outcomes are typically okay. Um, you could see motor improvement uh, progressing up to a one-year post-op. Uh, bladder function can take a little longer. The, the best predictor of recovery is pre-op neurostatus. So depending on how they are when they come in, uh, is going to determine to some extent how well they're going to recover. And up to 40% can still have residua, even with the best uh, timed treatment. All right, so uh, next thing we're going to talk about are fractures. So I'm um, actually going to pause here and um, we'll uh, pick up in the next video. Thanks.